Welcome to another uh, interview in the series Classics Confidential. This time I'm in Cambridge with Professor David Sedley, who's the Lawrence Professor of Ancient Philosophy, and an expert in, amongst other things, uh, the uh, philosophy of atheism in antiquity. So, David, can you start by telling us a little bit about why you became interested in this topic? Yes, well, it's a bit of a mystery to me still, because my, my interest is ma mainly in thinkers I radically disagree with. <laughs> uh, they're much more interesting than people you agree with, but in this particular case, well, I, I confess to being an atheist um, myself. Uh, and it, what has brought me to it really has been my, my work on um, ancient theology rather more generally, and my discovery, or at least my, my very strong impression, that uh, there's um, a whole atheist movement uh, which has been largely ignored simply through mishandling of the evidence. So could you tell us a little bit more about that atheist movement and what, what were the um, different types of atheism that we find in antiquity at different times? Well, uh, the first atheism seems to me to occur in the late 5th century BC and it took a particular a combination of intellectual advances to make it possible. One was uh, the idea that the world could have formed by the purely mechanical properties of matter without any kind of intelligence being involved. That had been uh, developed by the atomists in particular who were active in the late 5th century. Along with that it needed an anthropological theory which could explain how um, the concept of God could have arisen at a relatively late stage in the development of, um, of human civilization. Uh, and that, again, was the kind of theory that was being developed on a massive scale by sophistic and other thinkers of the 5th century. So that's, the, that's why, where I think it begins. Uh, the evidence for the, uh, there being a, the, an atheist movement in that period comes from Book 10 of Plato's Laws, a text which uh, I think has been rather underexploited for this purpose. Then uh, there are one or two people known as so-and-so the atheists who appear at odd points in history, but we really don't know whether they call themselves atheists or whether that was what others call them in a critical vein. Or what that word even means. Oh, yes, that, that there are questions. Quite The Greek word is atheos, which we translate atheist, but actually it has a broader range than that. <coughs> the other uh, really f uh, important phase, from my point of view, is uh, in the 2nd century BC, Carneades, who was the... Uh, head of the uh, academy, the school founded by Plato, which had become a sceptical school in his own day. Um, he had a huge number of arguments against the existence of God, uh, and these have been largely sidelined by historians of atheism on the, because we've been misled by an apologetic remark made by Cicero, who reports some of them, who said, oh, he wasn't really an atheist, he was just trying to show that the Stoics couldn't prove anything about their theology. He was against rational theology. That really seems contrary to the evidence. These were, these were arguments for atheism. Not because he was an atheist, he was actually an agnostic. Sceptics have to be agnostics when it comes to uh, re religious questions. Uh, but um, he, uh, in order to establish agnosticism, he had to show there were equal forces of argument for and against the existence of God. Nobody had, prior to him had produced arguments against the existence of God, so it was left to him to do it, and he did it on a massive scale. Those are the two main phases, I think. Uh, they're not incompatible with each other, but they represent different motivations. And what about Epicureanism? Do you think Epicureanism ties into the story as well? Well, I do personally. Here I'm on dangerous ground because uh, I, I share uh, what is, remains a minority view about Epicurus. Epicurus uh, d did say quite explicitly the gods exist. Uh, the question is, did he mean by that uh, that out there, somewhere in, in uh, the infinite universe, there are these divine beings which uh, somehow manage to achieve immortality? Uh, or did he rather mean they exist at some other level? I take the view, which was now known as the idealist interpretation, uh, that he actually meant the gods exist as moral ideals and they are constructed by our, our own powers of thought. Uh, that's a huge uh, question depending on interpretation of quite technical evidence. But uh, the, uh, if that were the case, then Epicurus would be, from our angle, an atheist. Uh, but he would have perfectly good uh, motivations in, in his own society for saying it's a form of theism. There are parallels for uh, presenting that kind of view um, where the gods are, as it were, human thought constructs. As if it were um, a theistic view, you can find the same in Thomas Hardy, for example, a number of thinkers of the 19th century. So um, Epicurus on this reading would be an idealist in the sense that um, the idea of God is an ideal to which humans aspire but has no um, objective existence outside of... That's, that's right. We all in intuitively form a concept of our ideal being. If we're morally misguided, as most of us are, then we will attach inappropriate epithets to this ideal being, like warlikeness or vindictiveness. 
Uh, that's because we think that being politically powerful is part, is part of what constitutes a good life. But if we've got our minds sorted out and we know that actually it's just a detachment of tranquility that makes a good human life, then of course we will realise that that's the, na the true divine nature. And then we won't be scared of the gods any longer because even if they exist out there in some sense, they wouldn't have any motive to, yes. to interfere in our lives. The standard theistic reading of Epicureanism, as I understand it, um, rests upon the idea that people can perceive the gods, and because perceptions are true, therefore there must be gods. How would you counter that kind of objection? Well, uh, th this does get quite technical again, <laughs> uh, but uh, e according to Epicurus, um, uh, we mainly have epiphanies of gods in our dreams, and the Epicureans are extremely clear that what you experience in your dreams can mislead you if you imagine that beings that appear to move must therefore really be alive. We construct our dream images. Uh, why, if I dream of, of somebody walking down the road, I'm actually uh, c capturing a series of separate images in a cin cin cinematographic fashion, uh, which give, give the impression of, of walking. If I imagine that I've actually met, had an encounter with a living, walking person, then I've overinterpreted the dream. Right. So actually the dream theory tends to support the idealist dream okay. against the realist one. Okay. So. Um, um, your picture of atheism in antiquity in general would be one in which um, there is an awful lot of atheist intellectual work going on mm -hmm. under the surface, but for various reasons our evidence um, doesn't, uh, or has, uh, the nature of our evidence has concealed that, and also the nature of modern readings have yes. concealed that. The one compounds the other, is that right? That's right. Uh, my, my view, for what it's worth, is that uh, as in many other societies um, over, through, throughout history, atheism was a, a dangerous position to take, to question the existence of the very gods on whose, uh, well, uh, who, whose um, support the, the survival of the city was taken to the pen. Uh, that, that was to, to incur all kinds of risks. There was, we, we have pretty good evidence that in Athens in the 430s BC there was legislation against, uh, against atheism, or at any rate against questioning the existence of, um, of the divinities. Uh, so my own view is that actually w with the history of atheism you've got to look below the surface. People didn't simply come out as atheists. Mm -hmm. Even the thinkers that Plato talks about in Book Ten of the Laws, um, who seem to be very specific authors who wrote, he says, both in prose and verse, even those are extremely difficult to identify by name. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think it was, I'm not talking about being a, 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 just a humble citizen who doubted the existence of the gods, I'm talking about being a public intellectual who denied the existence of the gods. That was a risky stance. There was, prosecution was always a possibility. After all, Socrates was prosecuted mm. uh, largely on such charges. Uh, so we should always be reading between the lines in order to detect the existence of atheistic movements. And you've um, written about various strategies that people have adopted in order to uh, reduce the risk uh, of being prosecuted for atheism. Mm. So, for example, you've spoken about the, uh, the Sisyphus fragment, uh, which you read as a, a sort of disguised, covert narrative for the initiated uh, in terms of atheism. W would that be a fair characterisation? Yes. Uh, the, the point about the, the Sisyphus fragment is this. This is a fragment of, uh, from a play we don't know whether the whole play was in circulation, but at any rate, this passage from a play was in circulation, uh, probably anonymously, uh, because at any rate, there was a dispute in, already in antiquity about whether to attribute it, its authorship to, uh, to Euripides or to Critias. My suspicion is that it may have been from neither. This may just be a symptom of the fact that it was an anonymous fragment. So that's all, an anonymity is already a form of self-protection for the author. Then. Uh, the atheistic ideas were put into the mouth of this character, Sisyphus, a thoroughly bad person who uh, uh, myth tells us later was punished in, by having to push a, a boulder uphill for all eternity and then just before he got to the top it rolled down again. He was punished by the very gods whose existence he denied. So the context is one in, in which the author has achieved maximum self-protection against the charge of atheism, both by an anonymity and by putting the, the, the atheistic theory, which is, by the way, the theory that the gods were invented by politicians to, to scare the population mm. into obedience to the law. Uh, that, 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 that uh, the further form of self-protection that is put into that character's um, mouth. Um, so yes, so, that, that, that's, yeah. so it's almost as if the um, the implicit narrative structure there, which says that, that this is a bad person who's going to be punished, is a way of legitimising, or not necessarily legitimising, but freeing up space in which you can insert these very... very that's very, right, yeah. and what we have very good evidence of is that this little speech about how the gods were invented by politicians uh, was 
taken in its own right as an atheistic text. It caused great scandal, but it, it must have been um, a, um, an authoritative text for those um, plucky people who actually dare to, um, to, to discuss atheistic ideas among themselves. Where do you see Plato's role in <clears throat> all of this? You mentioned Laws 10, mm -hmm. which is, as you say, um, a very important text for the history of atheism, but it's also very condemnatory, isn't it? I mean, he calls atheism a disease at one point. In yes. The... Plato's view is that uh, belief in the gods is absolutely vital for moral uprightness. Uh, the, the, the gods, as presented by Plato in the Laws, they're not really those sort of semi-anthropomorphic beings of myth. They are basically the stars. Uh, they behave with the utmost orderliness, and internalising that orderliness um, in your own soul is, he thinks, is a vital part of being um, a morally uh, proper person. So uh, he admits that there are some good atheists who are also good people, but even the good atheists, and that's good in that sense, are a danger because they're bound to make fun of uh, religious rituals and they're bound to undermine others' moral beliefs. So he sees a very strong association with freeing yourself from belief in these divine beings and freeing yourself from moral norms. And to what extent is this bound up with a larger reflex against the prosecution of Socrates? Uh, I mean, so if Socrates is prosecuted for impiety mm. and part of that charge seems to be um, disbelieving in the gods, however you translate that very yeah. difficult phrase, um, to what extent is, is Plato forming an apologetic position for philosophers, saying philosophy is not um, what you think it is, it's not that very materialist, very um, anti-theistic uh, position, it, it is actually part of a, um, a socially normative theistic uh, world. It's very difficult to say, uh, I mean that's, that's uh, an attractive way of looking at it. Uh, then nevertheless there's a, there's a certain irony about the fact that Socrates, Socrates Plato's own teacher, was uh, condemned uh, on charges of religious heresy and in his late work, The Laws, Plato devotes a whole book to legislating against religious heresy um, even in extreme cases of proposing the death penalty, which is ironically a bit of ring composition when viewed against uh, the, the fate of his own teacher. Is, you, you mentioned that Plato uh, sees divinities not in the traditional anthropomorphic sense, but as, in effect, stars. Mm -hmm. Is that not in itself uh, quite a uh, heterodox position to take? Yes, um, it is. It's thought to have Babylonian origins. It, it comes in only around Plato's time. Uh, it, it's not that Plato positively denies the anthropomorphic gods or the, the ones we might think of as more uh, like individual um, divine agents. He doesn't deny them, but he's, he, they, they fall outside the realm of um, scientific theology. Uh, scientific theology can only concentrate on stars um, and, uh, and other major cosmic components like that. Um, so um, um, the, the stars are, in effect, uh, um, a way, a manifestation of the orderliness of the, the universe, and that mm. is divine, because... Uh, yes, um, and, they, and they, the divinities we witness when we look at the heavens are actually um, governing our lives as well, he, he, either directly or indirectly. But in doing it, in, in re-identifying re the tr uh, traditional gods, as cosmic entities like the stars, Plato is doing the sort of thing that many other philosophers have done without being accused of atheism. Uh, so among his predecessors, some said the world is basically uh, composed of the material stuff, the material stuff we call fire, and that fire is God. The God mm -hmm. is reducible to some kind of fire, but not merely you know, the stuff you get when you strike a match, actually, an intelligent force mm -hmm. rather like, uh, as we might think of, light and warmth as, uh, as a basis of life. And others had said um, all kinds of things like that. Maybe that the, the God is the air that we breathe. Th these scientific reductive accounts of God are quite common, and there's very little evidence that their proponents were suspected of atheism. As long as you said God exists in some uh, guise, mm. so that he could be worshipped and respected, fine. It was only when you made statements which appear to say that God is, is a human invention that, that you were in trouble. Um, but if we go back a generation earlier to, you mentioned uh, the, the trials in the 430s and particularly Anaxagoras, it becomes a bit of a byword for mm -hmm. um, impious thought. Uh, Anaxagoras is associated with the idea that uh, the heavenly bodies are made of matter and that seems to be the troubling element 
there. Uh, whereas, uh, uh, as I understand it, Anaxagoras also makes allusion to um, noose, uh, to mind, which could be ad identified with a theistic principle. Yeah. So what, what is it about um, the material, the idea that um, the heavenly bodies are made out of stone or rock or whatever, rather than fire or air? Why, why is that particularly troubling to you? Yes, I think that, that is quite, quite a puzzle. Uh, it's not so much that uh, heretical to think that gods are made of matter because the idea of immaterial being is, is quite a, sl a slow arrival on the scene and made up, made, some people think it doesn't predate Plato himself. But yes, Anaxagoras looks like a theistic thinker to us. Why? Because he says that all the matter in the world has been organised uh, into its present form by a, um, an intelligence, as you say, the Greek word is nous, uh, and, and uh, that intelligence looks to us like a divinity. Uh, Anaxagoras, as far as we can tell, never said this uh, intelligence is God, but it was a perfectly compatible view to, to, uh, uh, to take as, as a reading of him. Uh, so it seems that his, uh, the, the fact that he was prosecuted in Athens for, um, for, for atheism, or at any rate for impiety, which, which, although some have doubted it, I think it's very likely to be the case that this trial did take place, or at least was, was threatened, uh, that doesn't seem to have anything to do with what he said about intelligence governing the world. That seems to do purely with one specific claim he'd made, which is that the sun is, not, is really just a red-hot stone. He, he did, it's true, deny the divinity of the sun. Uh, now, it's not really clear that that was such a heretical belief um, in its own right. I think it's much more likely that this was the, uh, that there was legislation against denying divinities um, current at the time, uh, this was where his enemies could get him, but, uh, e even though it didn't really add up to a, um, a ser serious or credible charge of atheism. So it's a politically motivated attack on not just Anaxagoras but Pericles as well. Right, as he was a close associate of Pericles. It, we don't know the detail, we can't reconstruct the details of that, but it's hard to believe that just saying that the sun is a red hot stone right. was, was enough by itself. It, it was more the pretext. Right, well I think at this point we should wrap things up, but thank you very much David. Thank you very much.